On BBC One Now, another 40 minutes of things that make you go, hmm. Is S. Sorensen older than the planet? One, two. Yes. <laughs> Good evening, thank you for all the letters and pictures you've sent him this week and uh, the warnings, like for example, who would trust a barber Brian Harris found in Italy called Ubaldo? <laughs> and who would send anyone the Get Well card Mrs Breen found in Wantage in Oxfordshire? Sorry to hear you've not been well. Rest in peace. <laughs> <laughs> and who on earth would ever eat the breakfast cereal Joy Periton from Exmouth found when she was in Brittany? Crapsy fruit. <laughs> Later in the programme, we'll be asking you why anyone would want to drink 15,000 jars of Nescafe, and we'll be meeting the sheep who thinks she's a bloodhound. And uh, don't forget that our hotline is open for the next two hours. If you have any urgent information about some of the stories we tell you about tonight, or perhaps you've got your own story, give us a call 081 752 4444. But first, we want to introduce you to our special guest star tonight, star of stage, screen, and I'm sorry I haven't a clue, Mr. Barry Cryer. <laughs> A lot of chat this week about Dennis Healy and Norman Lamont and that... Oh, the commercial, commercial. They, they took off, yes. You know that expression, knitting your eyebrows? You could knit a pullover out of Dennis Healy's eyebrows. I certainly could. But I love commercials. All the years I've loved them. Real ones. Mm. Um, there's one years ago, Long Life, the beer that begins where the others end up. That was a real <laughs> one. <laughs> Roll on Mum deodorant. On. Used to say on it, unscrew top and push up bottom. Oh, <laughs> True. Well, we've got some real-life cuttings for you later in the programme. If you'd like to riffle through, in the Gladly. meantime, ladies and gentlemen, Mr Barry Cryer. Have you heard this week's number one of the singles chart? It's called Doop and it's by Doop. And would you believe it's the Charleston. The Charleston is back. Do you remember the Charleston? Only in history books. Uh, history books, yes. Oh, get away. You must remember the Charleston. No, no, no. Do you remember the Charleston, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Someone else who does is, ladies and gentlemen, Lionel Blair. <laughs> Yes, but I can never do it. Black black ball, Vanessa. What's the black ball? Arms up in the air, Esther. I'm still blacking my bottom. Yes. Right, yes. No, quicker, quicker. What? Quicker, quicker. 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 What's this one? I can see why this went out. We wondered whether other people have still danced to the Charleston, so Doc Cox took Duke with him out onto the streets to find out. Lionel's going to judge them all. Okay. You on top of the pops. Yes. Number one. Yes. It's the Charleston. <laughs> so, yes, the Charleston. Yes. Probably not the Charleston. Do the Charleston, Frank. Well. <laughs> Yeah, Charleston. <laughs> Are you one of those gym slip mums that we hear about? Because you look so good. So <laughs> well, I tell you what, something, no. something's coming back now. 
that, that is, is a new disco oh, dance. Oh, yeah, can that tell you green thing that goes like that. <laughs> that thing that goes like the Charleston. <laughs> Oh, look at that! Yeah. Oh, that's very nice. Oh, that's that's that's, that's better that's than the real. That's my Marta, that is. <laughs> so, 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 I'll grab your case. Right. I'll grab your case. I'll hold your bag. Vital uh, evidence in there. Vital evidence. <laughs> okay. Oh, it's, it's all uh, it's all special photographs of cabinet ministers in that's there. That's right. Very lovely Joe. Who's going to teach you how to do? Oh, 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 oh. Marvelous, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Salman Rushdie. Salman Rushdie, ladies and gentlemen. Shirley Temple. <laughs> Easy. Very yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> good. Have you seen the rain Yes. I'll go. You have to recreate the spirit of the 1920s. Okay. See, as if the Tories weren't doing that already. So we've all got to start. <laughs> People out there, yeah, watching us doing this for the first time, yeah, what's your advice to them to learn this step? Do it or die. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do? Die. <laughs> It's a mixture of everything. I mean, that is sort of 1940s. That's jitterbugging, isn't oh, it? Is it? Yeah. Yes, and, and that. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. And because I used to do an act called The Charleston to the Twist, and yes. actually, The Charleston and the Twist is quite similar. Do you remember? That's The Charleston, you see. Yeah. And then they used to do that. Well, you used to do that in The Twist, if you remember. So it's all, all coming back again. And as for that, yes. well, I've been doing that for years. Ladies and gentlemen, Lana Blair! Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's been a very exciting week for Kevin because he's been on a trail that went all the way from Britain to Amsterdam and then to Las Vegas in pursuit of an amazing £6,500 prize. Kevin? Hello? Hello, Kevin, can you hear me? Just a minute, Esther. What's the weather like in Amsterdam? Well, how the hell should I know? Because the BBC couldn't afford to send me. <laughs> so you see, they spared every expense and built a cardboard Dutch street complete with the weather. Yeah, well, we can't really afford any more rain. It's the BBC cuts, you know. Ah, the new BBC. Well, getting back to the story, I have got all the letters with me from the viewers who thought they'd won this fantastic prize. For example, Beryl Monday from Cornwall. She got a letter posted in from Amsterdam that actually encloses a cheque made out to her. And the letter offers her sincere congratulations and says the prize is guaranteed £6,500 if... Woo! If what? Well, the first if is if she can cope with the game of skill, which is to circle the words you and when in the following series of letters. We, you, I, wa, when. <laughs> that looks possible. Well, it must be because I managed it. It did take me 20 minutes, but I got there. And the second thing you have to do is send a £5 judging fee. Ah, uh, mm, that's not so much fun. Especially not when you know that what then happens is that you're one of one and a half million people who are also, in quotes, guaranteed the same prize. So they all send off the money, and the organiser, uh, organisers are expecting to rake in seven and a half million pounds out of this. Now, the money trail goes something like this. It starts off at a postal address in Balham, to another postal address in Amsterdam. It wings its way across the Atlantic to the head office of this company, which is Imperial Marketing in Las Vegas, Nevada. Now, they're making a fortune. They get 50,000 letters a day. Well, at least you look warm and dry there. What's the weather like in Las Vegas? If you want me to find out what the weather's like in Vegas, I'll go any time. Well, get, does anyone ever win any of these prizes, really? Yes, but only 100 people win, which means that I calculate the odds are best 15,000 to 1 that any of our viewers will get the prize. Actually, the odds are worse than that now. They are zilch. Why? Partly because the US Postal Service have had so many complaints, about 20,000 complaints over the last few years for Imperial Marketing and their associated companies. So that's clipped their wings a bit. And partly because they haven't been very successful here in Britain. That's rather good news. Yes, it's great. I reckon quite a few people who've had these 
phony prize cheques have sent them to us instead of sending the five pounds to Imperial Marketing. So we had a letter on Thursday saying, we have decided to not offer the contest in England. And they say they're going to refund any money people have sent them. How much money do you reckon they've already made out of people in Britain? Nearly £25,000. When they actually hoped for much more. Well, I can imagine they did. But the refund is even better news then. But suppose our viewers don't get their £5 back? Then I suggest they write to me and tell me. And I'm afraid the BBC are going to have to pay for me to go to the streets of Amsterdam, track the mail trail, then storm Las Vegas and say to this company, our viewers want their money back. But meanwhile, <laughs> I'll storm the studio. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> If you do get away, don't forget to send us a postcard, will you? No problem. Thanks very much. Now, of course, this is the time for everybody to dream about summer holidays, maybe look forward to Easter holidays. Anyhow, think about blue skies and beautiful scenery. At least, that is what Archer and Isabel Firth, who live in Blair Gowrie in Perthshire, were dreaming about this time last year. Archer told us... We're in our mid-70s. We wanted to go somewhere really special to celebrate our golden wedding next year. And we found something in a brochure for Northern American travel. That sounded perfect. It was a two-week luxury coach tour in the Rockies in Canada. And the brochure said... The perfect vacation. Vacation, great hotels, unsurpassed natural wonders in five national parks, unique shopping experiences in fascinating cities, the untamed country, awesome mountains, rushing rivers, imposing cliffs, snow-capped mountain ranges, bears, mountain goats, furry marmots, and stately deer. You said furry marmots. <laughs> furry marmots. <laughs> Or firmish marmots. Anyway, Archer told us... It was to be the holiday of a lifetime. It was four years in the planning. We were very pernickety about it. We chose very carefully, or so we thought. So, on the 17th of May last year, Archer and Isabel flew from Glasgow to Heathrow to catch the flight from Heathrow all the way across to Vancouver here. And that was where they were going to meet the coach, he told us. Unfortunately, the air traffic control computer failed delaying all flights that day. But we were told that wouldn't be too much of a problem because the flight onto Vancouver was delayed as well. Strangely enough, although we couldn't book our seats on the Vancouver flight when we checked in at Glasgow, our luggage was booked straight through. That is odd. You should surely have been booked all the way through too. Well, we thought so, but they said no. In fact, when we arrived at Heathrow, they called our names out, took us to the shuttle area and then told us we'd missed the Vancouver flight. You must have been badly delayed. Well, we were only delayed an hour, and in fact, our Vancouver flight hadn't taken off. But that didn't make any difference. They just said we were too late. We'd missed it. They offered us overnight accommodation at a local hotel. But that would have been useless. We would have missed our coach in Canada. We would never have caught up with our dream holiday. Eventually, after a 20-minute discussion, some of which was quite heated, they agreed to put us plus two Canadians who were in the same predicament onto a plane to Los Angeles so we could fly from there to Vancouver. Los Angeles to Vancouver, which is that distance. In fact, the flight they should have been on, the flight to Vancouver they had tickets for, took off 29 minutes after after the Los Angeles flight. They hadn't actually missed their own flight at all. But of course, at the time, they didn't know that. They were told they would have to get to gate 50 very quickly to catch the Los Angeles plane. Isabel told us... In fact, they told us to run. We were carrying hand luggage. The young woman with us was 50 years younger than Archer and me. She speeded up. Well, we tried to keep up, but it began to be a bit of a struggle. When we got to gate 50, there was a long flight of stairs. Now, Archer has a shaky knee, and he tried to keep up, but he missed three steps and fell against a concrete wall. He was obviously in severe pain. He thought he must have torn a muscle. Then, when we reached the bottom of the stairs, we found we had to wait ten minutes for a bus with the rest of the passengers. There'd been no need to run at all. Still, they got on the plane to Los Angeles, Isabel told us. The flight was awful. Archer was in real agony. When we landed in Los Angeles, they told us BA had given us the wrong landing cards. Six jumbo jets had just landed. We had to queue in the longest queue you've ever seen to represent new ones. Then we had to walk half a mile to catch our flight, and by the time we got there, we found we'd missed that plane too by three minutes. There was nothing they could do except find their way back to the British Airways desk in LA Airport. Alan Mulholland, one of the Canadians who'd been stuck along with them, told us... When we got back to the BA desk, there was nobody on duty. Twenty minutes went by before anybody came to help four passengers stranded in LA with no luggage. And I was extremely concerned about Mr Firth's health. In fact, both of them were showing signs of obvious distress from heat exhaustion, which was caused by the long marches between terminals. When someone from BA did arrive, they were booked in overnight in a Los Angeles hotel. But they arrived there at 11pm and then had to get up again at 5.15 in the morning to check in for the flight to Vancouver early next morning. 
they caught it, they actually got to Vancouver, where Archer was reunited with his luggage. But Isabel's had gone missing. The Canadians gave them a lift to their hotel in Victoria, which at least meant they caught up with their coach. But that night, Archer collapsed. He was rushed to hospital, where they put him on antibiotics for a week. But then when he was no better, the doctors there decided they'd have to do an exploratory operation on him. Archer told us... When I came round, I had a terrible shock. They'd given me a colostomy. A surgeon came rushing over. I asked him what the hell had happened. He said they'd had no alternatives, otherwise I'd have been dead. I had a torn bowel and bladder. He spent the next 14 days recovering in hospital. The good news is that while he was there, Isabel's luggage turned up. She told us... I don't know where it had been. No doubt it had had the holiday of a lifetime. <laughs> but I had to buy essential clothes and things to tide me over. And although the hotel allowed me to stay with them, we still had to wire money over to pay for our flights home. Why on earth did you have to do that? You'd already paid for your flights home. Because Archer had to spend so long in hospital, ten days past the end of our holiday, we'd missed those flights too. How was the trip home? I hardly dare ask. Well, it went much as you might expect, really. BA told us they'd arranged a wheelchair for Archer, and when we were due to land in Heathrow, the steward told us to wait until everybody else had got off the plane so Archer could get into the wheelchair. So we waited, and we waited. There wasn't a wheelchair. They had to ring and order one. It took an hour to arrive, so we missed our shuttle back to Glasgow. When we got home, at last, exhausted, we found British Airways had sent us a bunch of flowers with the compliments of the Customer Relations Service. That just added the final salt to my wounds. If I could have found somewhere to stuff them, I would have. <laughs> Understandably. Now, BA say they weren't responsible for Archer's illness, but Archer says his GP examined him two days before they left their holiday, and he was perfectly fit then. But let's say he was already getting ill. Clearly, that ghastly trip, being made to rush about, falling, queuing, missing, plane after plane through no fault of their own, made him much, much worse and cost them both the holiday they dreamed about. And in terms of money, it had cost them £3,248. Now, they claimed on their insurance, shore travel, but although they got back the cost of the flights home, the hotel, the clothes Isabella had brought, they couldn't claim the total cost of the holiday because they hadn't come home early. And that, of course, was because Archer wasn't well enough to fly home. If they had flown home and he'd had the surgery over here, well, then they would have got the cost of the whole coach trip they missed. But because they stayed longer in Canada, even though he was in hospital and she was at his bedside, instead of in the untamed countryside and snow-capped mountains, the insurance company refused to pay up. That has gone to the insurance ombudsman to see if he thinks that's fair. But of course, all of these many catastrophes were caused by BA. From being told they'd missed the flight when they hadn't, to being given the wrong landing cards and no wheelchair and missing the shuttle back and, in fact, losing their whole holiday. So we spoke to British Airways. They told us they'd offered the first £500 worth of British Airways vouchers. The first pointed out they were not likely to travel British Airways again. So then BA sent them a cheque for the £500, but that doesn't go anywhere near the more than £3,000 they'd spent on the holiday they'd dreamed about. We mentioned that to BA. They said... We're very sorry and we're keen to make amends. We would like to offer Mr and Mrs Firth a similar holiday in the Canadian Rocky Mountains. And to give them a flying start, this would begin with a special supersonic flight to Washington on Concorde. Well, the Firths are delighted, but please at home, let us know if this sort of thing has happened to you. Has it happened to you, Barry? I used to fly Virgin, Esther, but that's a long time ago. <laughs> now, we're, um, we're offering prizes tonight for the best anagrams you can think up. Richard Stilgo discovered that Edwina Curry is an anagram of ICI underwear. <laughs> and Virginia Bottomley is, I'm an evil Tory bigot. <laughs> Wait for this one. Margaret Thatcher is that great charmer.